Good morning, Professor. Morning. Uh, let me explain the arrangements. Um, you're talking to an audience which uh, consists largely of particip participants and co-participants in front of you, and to your left, uh, lawyers, uh, at the very back, uh, representatives of the, the press. Beyond this room, however, you're talking to a larger audience, uh, yesterday numbered in uh, the region of about 300 or so, uh, who watch on live stream uh, and on YouTube. So that's who you're talking to. Uh, you will be asked the questions in a moment or two by Ms. Fraser Butlin once Mary has uh, invited you to take the oath. Mary. Please state your full name. Derek Michael Mann. Take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Professor Manus, you are a professor of transplant surgery and a consultant hep hepatobiliary and transplant surgeon in Newcastle. I am. And you've been involved in setting up super regionally funded transplant programs in the Northeast. I have. Can you tell us, first of all, um, about those programs and what, they've, what you've established? Um, so when I, came to, when I got to the Northeast of England, which I, I, I did a fellowship in the U United States, um, and I went to the northeast of England serendipitously, really, um, and they were, set, they were trying to set up a liver transplant program. I was a liver surgeon who had, a, had been trained in liver transplant. There was a surgeon there who was on his own, and I, I joined. And as time went on, we started to build up a number of services, including liver transplant, kidney transplant, pancreas transplant, a big liver surgery service, and that took a number of years, but they were all super regionally funded. It means NHS, NH, the NHS specialist commissioners funded it outside of, of the regional or local commissioning, and so they became super regional services. And that, is, that model has changed over the years, but this was 30 years ago. You've also established the Institute of Transplantation yeah. in 2008. Um, what, what's the remit of that institute? So um, Newcastle is unique in, in the country in that it does all forms of transplantation in one place. That includes cardiothoracic, that's heart and lung, pancreas, kidney, liver, s s bone marrow, um, and, and cell transplant, islet transplants, which are cells that produce insulin. Um, and so we thought, instead of having them in different places across the city, we'd bring them together into one place. And so, very luckily, just before the, the, the crash in 2008, we managed to get funding from, from the government to build an institute that brings all this together, including clinical staff uh, um, and research staff, and actually for the betterment of the, the patients, which is ultimately what the aim was, and if you read the mission statement, it's about making the patient's journey and their life much better. And we got that funded, we built the building, and we brought all those clinical groups together into one place. So we have a very unique setup in that we have a, a clinical ward that has every form of transplantation in that ward. It's managed by the same nurses, so you can, the nurses could do dialysis, they could ventilate patients, they could put tracheostomies in, they could do apheresis. So it is an extremely unique place, and I'm very proud of how we, I mean, I, I, it was my idea, but actually they delivered it in an amazing way, and it's still going very strongly today. And you're currently the NHSBT Medical Director of Organs and Tissue Donation and Transplantation. Can you tell us what that role involves? Um, so as the Medical Director, my role is to, is to um, deal with the medical issues that, that NHSBT have to deal with. NHSBT is an arms length organization within the NHS. Um, a number of clinicians uh, are seconded to certain period, amount of time with NHSBT. And it's really, NHSBT looks at organ donation and organ allocation, 
and they, they regulate to a degree with NHS England the outcome of transplantation. All those areas have a very strong clinical remit and my role is to be is to manage that clinical remit with my colleagues around the country. So I have a big clinical team that I work with. They all have one PA, which means they have a, probably three hours a week dedicated to NHSBT. So my role is to corral them all to make sure we, we are managing all the forms of organ transplant. We have advisory groups for each organ, which are made up of clinicians from each center and my role is to listen to what they advise about how to best manage the patients, how to, what policies we should, we should be instituting, and then to make sure that those are, those are instituted fairly and, and amicably without um, prejudice, really. And it's uh, right, isn't it, that it's the NHSBT who has the responsibility for developing and reviewing policies to a, that address the selection of liver transplant recipients. Yeah. So OTDT, which is the part of NHSBT that deals with organs, that's it's their responsibility. Yeah. And you were part of the committee that designed the National Liver Offering Scheme, and that's a scheme that we're going to work through yeah. in quite a lot of detail today. Mm -hmm. But broadly, it's the scheme through which all liver grafts donated from deceased brain dead donors are allocated to, to named liver recipients. That's right. Yeah. All right. Um, you mentioned the advisory groups. In terms of the liver advisory group, can you tell us a little bit more about the remit of that group, what it addresses? Well, with, with all advisory groups, um, their, their role is to advise NHSBT. Um, it's, it's to look at patient pathways, to look at developing policies that will, as, as me medicine changes, and, and, and treatment changes, the policies need to change to be in line with getting patients with certain diseases transplanted in a more timely way, to, to look at different techniques, particularly now at the moment we're looking very much at machine perfusion for organs, looking at, at concentrates and the use of, best use of organs and how we can especially when the organ numbers are going down, how we can increase, increase the numbers, use them in a different way. So that's their role, is to say, well, you know, there's this new research coming out, why aren't we doing that? And, then, and so we, the, the main group meets twice a year, but actually there are a number of smaller groups within the main group that meet much more often than that. They have a chairman, and the chairman is directly responsible to me. And we meet, I meet the chairman every month, with all the advisory groups to look at whether there's certain things they want to try and bring in. Um, for example, xenotransplant, which is uh, um, organs from animals, which I'm sure everyone's heard about what, you know, in the news recently. And our role is to scope that and see where we are in the UK about instituting that, if ever. Um, but those are the kind of things we talk about. And then it's also about um, making sure that all the units in the country are functioning well, that they've got sustainability, that patients aren't being disadvantaged. So if a unit goes down, for example, during COVID, we had a lot of problems with staffing going down because of COVID, because they were ill. And what happened to the patients on the waiting list? So we had to then institute mutual aid. And that was done all through the advisory group. So the only way you can do that is is to use the advisory group to do that. So we moved patients from one centre to another during that time to be transplanted. Um, so that's, that's what we do. And on the advisory group are a number of patient representatives. So we have lay members, so there are two lay members on every advisory group, and they're appointed by an external organisation. And we have some very, in, very um, high-flying lay members, people who have got a lot of insight into what, what we do, and ethics, for example. We have a professor of ethics at the moment on one of the advisory groups. And then we have patient, two patient representatives on each group. So, so in terms of the uh, consistency of the group, the, the, who, who is on the group, you've talked about clinicians from designated centres. Lay yeah, every centre is represented in each advisory group, usually two clinicians from each centre. Two clinicians from each centre, some lay members and some patient representatives. 
Is there anyone else who then there's, the, then so, there's always someone from the commissioners. So, and NHS England are the commissioners for the sp highly specialised services. Renal transplant is commissioned regionally, although NHS England funded, they actually don't get involved in the nuts and bolts. It's done regionally. But liver transplant, pancreas transplant, heart and lung are super regionally funded. So it's the, the NHS England Commission is always at the meeting. Um, there's, there is an option to have someone from the Department of Health. They don't always, they're not always there, but they have a seat. They're a non-voting member. And then we have uh, societies um, that we interact with. So societies, professional societies that we, that we communicate with, as well as um, patient support groups. So, for example, for the liver one, we have the PSC Society, we have uh, Autoimmune Society, we have uh, the British Liver Trust. So they all have a seat at the table. And in terms of the patient and patient groups, is there any representation on the liver advisory group uh, from patients or patient groups from the infected blooding, blood community? No, no, there isn't. Is that something that the group has considered, whether it would be uh, helpful? Um, w to be honest, we haven't specifically spoken about those group of patients. We did, at a, a, a number of years ago, talk about the issue of hepatitis C in patients who got, got infected and got hepatitis C, but it wasn't because of the change in the treatment at the time. Um, it was becoming such a revolutionary change that it wasn't felt that it was required because hepatitis C was becoming less and less of an important indication for liver transplant. And you know, in the last in the last five years, the it, the number of patients with hepatitis C on the transplant list across the country is down to single figures. Whereas, you know, before the, the drugs that we currently use were, were available, they were in, it was in double figures. It was, hepatitis C was never a big issue in this country compared to other countries in Europe, for example, in Europe, such as Italy, particularly the Middle East, they were, it was a much bigger problem there. But it was a growing problem until the new DAH came out. And, it, and those drugs got more and more refined to the point now where they are so good that 99% of patients have a sustained viral response to them. There are very few that don't. I want to come back to the question of hepatitis C when we look at the recipient characteristics right. in yeah. the flow chart, and, and it's something I think we will explore in a moment. But before we jump into that, I just want to uh, work through with you some of the bigger, bigger, uh, broader policy uh, issues. Um, in your statement, you describe two broad approaches to patient selection and organ allocation mm -hmm. in terms of listing everyone all restricting the list to those who will have a reasonable expectation that they'll receive a transplant. Can you um, help us with what the relative pros and cons are of listing everyone who might benefit from a transplant procedure? Okay, so um, it's really about supply and demand. Um, and we have about 1,500 donors, organ donors a year on a, in a good year. Um, this year we'll probably have less, unfortunately, because post-COVID, I think there's a feeling, um, a, a less of an altruistic feeling in the population because of the issues that everyone faces. You know, 18 hours away from an ambulance, sitting in an A&E for hours, you become less likely to say yes after being with your loved one who's now died, if you've been there for 24 hours. I mean, I, you can understand people are just saying, I've had enough, you know, I can't even think about organ donation. So the numbers of donors are going down and the consent rates are going down. So if we say on average we've got about 1,300 donors a year, that's 1,300 potential, potential liver donors. Um, if you list everyone who, who may or could benefit from a liver transplant and could have a small chance of survival, then you could have a massive list of people who are going to get false, false hope because, because you're not going to get a good outcome. So there are some countries in the world, Germany, for example, was very uh, commonly used to list everyone who the clinicians thought may need a liver transplant. 
That's called uh, listing on the basis of need. And there are lots of patients who think who would, who would think that that's the right thing to do, and I can understand that. Need is the most important thing that drives even our system. But you can't list everyone if you think their outcome is going to be futile. So if you've got, if you've got a 10 percent chance of survival from a having a liver transplant, what about the patient who's got a 99 percent chance of survival? Because they're going to be competing with each other. So what we had to do was make sure that actually with the we were going to get the biggest benefit out of, out of offering the, the a re scarcity of organs. And not necessarily saying we only want people who are going to survive and we want to do it with people who don't survive, but it's about the balance between what is the need and what is the chance of actually having a successful outcome and a longevity where people, patients will survive a long time. It's pointless giving them an organ and they're dead in six months. That, that's not going to help anybody. That's a, it's really expensive, um, and, and you, you may be disadvantaging someone who may have a much better outcome. So we had to find that balance. So we created what's called the minimal listing criteria. So there are seven liver transplant centers in the country. And in the, in the early 90s, people could list anyone they wanted. They could put anyone on a list, and they'd have their own list. And the problem is what we found was that there was a huge disparity between different units. And so some patients would go to, I don't know, unit A and, and never get a chance or never get a transplant. Some would go to unit B and they'd get a transplant, whatever, and then have a very poor outcome. So the results were very poor in some centers, and uh, some centers were much better. And, but the, we found that actually they were listing very different patients with very different potential outcomes. And so we changed that to say that everyone had to have a minimum criteria that would give the patient at least a 50% chance of being alive in five years. Now that's, that's quite a low figure, but actually we, we didn't want to make it too high, so we gave people the chance. So 50% fiber survival was a very unique thing in the world. No one had ever set, it, set the bar at that level. And it became s s such a, uh, a thing that the whole world adopted it. So if you go anywhere in the world now, most liver transplant centers would say 50% survival is a standard. And so in order to create that, to, to get to that level, we had to think about what type of patients would get there. And so we created the minimalism criteria with the UKELT score. Now the UKELT score is a score that, that tells you how severe your liver disease is, and it's based on some blood parameters, um, bilirubin and, and the blood clotting, um, and, and whether, you've got, whether you've got fluid in your tummy. Um, it, and it kind of tells you how bad the liver is. And there's a score at which, below which, you can't list the patient. So it's set at 49, which is still quite low, but some patients will score 41 or less than that. And actually, at that point, and we did a lot of uh, modeling. So this was not just sucked out of our thumb. We had a lot of modeling and statistics done to look at, at what level of UCLD you would have a, a better chance of, being, of surviving without a liver than with a liver. In the US, they use a score called the MEL score, which is very similar, but we adopted our own score. And they set their level at 15, a MEL score of 15, which equates to a UKELD score, which is a little bit higher than that. But um, the evidence is that below that, if you get a liver transplant, your chance of dying from the liver transplant is greater than not having one. So that's why we set the score at 49. So that's where it is now. And that's where everyone, that's, all units have adopted that. So and just for clarity, a number lower than 49 would suggest that somebody is not as sick yeah, as not someone as sick. who has a higher That's right. UKELT. So you're not as sick, and you actually your benefit from a liver transplant, you'd probably do worse with a liver transplant, because liver transplant is a big procedure with lots of complications. So it's about saying, are you going to survive without the transplant better than you're going to survive with one? And that's where the level is set. And, and you know, NHSBT have some fantastic statistical support. We've got a big statistics department, and they've done all that modeling. And that's how we set all these policies. So we don't just sit around the table and say, well, what are we going to do now? It's all done very, very 
for patient care. And in terms of some of the, those broader uh, criteria, could we turn to WITN 7452002, please? This is an NHSBT policy, the introduction to patient selection and organ allocation policies. And if we turn to page three, we have some definitions um, for selection criteria, selection is defined, the criteria that's applied to determine if an individual is to be placed on the waiting list for an organ. Equity, a potential transplant recipient will have the same access to the national transplant list, irrespective of the centre at which they're assessed. And then in relation to allocation criteria, allocation, the process that's applied when an organ becomes available for transplantation. Equity, all patients with similar clinical characteristics on the national transplant waiting list shall have equal probability of receiving a graft from a deceased donor. Utility, allocation of an organ to the individual with the greatest number of life years following the transplant. And benefit, allocation of an organ to the individual who is clinically assessed as having the greatest increase in life years gained comparing survival with and without transplantation. Yeah. That's the definition section of the policy. Mm. But are they the broad sort of con uh, criteria and concepts that are used within yeah. the NHSBT? And, and this is obviously related to the, nat the, the, the national transfer list we have now. Before that, when individual centres listed their patients, the concern was, and the, the point about equity is, was, did everyone have the same chance of dying from their disease with or without a transplant wherever they were in the country? And the concern was that if you were in some part of the country, you would have a worse chance or a better chance. And we felt that that was unfair and it wasn't equitable. That's why we changed. That was one of the big drivers to change the system. And to bring in the national scheme. Yeah. Um, from your statement, there are two systems that operate. One in relation to deceased brain dead donors, mm -hmm. uh, which is the national scheme, and one in relation to donors after circulatory mm -hmm. deaths. Why is there a different policy of allocation in those two situations? Uh, so um, I have to go back to explain about the do donation. So donors traditionally, when organ donation started in 1954, and when the first real human-to-human -human organ transplant was carried out, they, those donors were donors who were taken to the operating room and they wait, wait until they died and then they had their organs removed. And that continued until the brain dead rules came into place and they, they, they came into place in the late 70s. And in the United Kingdom, Earl Hoffenberg was a professor of ethics at Co in Oxford who actually was the, the, the anaesthetist that, that provided the first donor for Chris Barnard's heart transplant, thought, how do we make this a much more ob objective decision? So they brought in the brain dead rules. And so in the, from, from about 1984 onwards, most donors were donors who were in intensive care who became brain dead. In other words, their heart was still beating, the blood was pumping around their body, but their brain was not going to recover. And those brain-dead criteria became accepted by the medical profession, by the Royal Society, and by the community at large. And they became the standard organ donors. In, 2000, in 2008, there was a change, because in Holland, they, they started, because the number of brain-dead donors started to decrease, they went back to thinking about donors who actually weren't brain dead, but, but their, their disease was not going to recover. The clinicians felt it was continuing was futile, but they didn't fulfill the brain dead criteria that was set out by Bill Hoffenberg in 1978. And so the plan was then to withdraw treatment and say to the family, there's nothing we can do, we're going to have to just stop. And you know, there are many people, maybe even in this audience, who have had that experience. Those, what happens then is once you withdraw the treatment, that's treatment that's supporting the heart, it's treatment that's supporting the lungs, everything just slows down and then stops. 
and that's called circulatory death. Now they're very different because the organs become uh, are, are, are very different. If you take a brain dead donor to an operating theatre and you remove their organs, you're removing organs that are still full of blood and getting oxygen until the minute you take them out. When you deal with a circulatory death donor, once they die, there is a process where you have to stand back for five, five between five and ten minutes, depending where you are in the world and wait until that donor doesn't show any chance of recovery. During that time, and during the process of dying, those organs are being starved of blood, starved of oxygen. So in the beginning, when we started using these organs, we noticed that they were, in, they were not as, not the same type of organ. I don't want to say inferior, they were just different. And we had to use them in a different way. So when we, well, when we set up the, the national offering system, because we were unsure how those organs were going to do in some of the patients, we kept them separate. We said those organs can be allocated locally by the clinicians who know their patients really well, who know their local list and who, are, who they feel are very urgent in their own center, keep the organs very local. So, in other words, we have a national organ retrieval service. So if the organ, if the donor's in, I don't know, um, Huddersfield, then the Leeds team would go and get that donor and, and, and take those organs. And the plan was, the, the process was, they would take them to, back to Leeds because it's a very short distance. Those organs aren't gonna be sitting in a box of ice getting deteriorating very quickly and they could use them for someone in their own team, in their own unit, that needed them. Whereas the, na the, the brain dead donor organs, they could withstand much longer journeys, they could withstand being in a box of ice for longer, and you could send them to other parts of the country safely. So that's why we excluded that group of patients to start with. I want to come back to the uh, donors after circulatory death that, that system, but if we can start off with the National Liver Offering Scheme uh, dealing with the deceased brain dead donors. Um, if we could turn to WITN 74520110 and turn to page two, the very helpful flow chart that summarises how the scheme works. The specialist nurse organ donation registers the donor with hub operations. Hub operations, that's the central body who's running this. That's the central hub in the NHS Blue Team that, that basically manages all the organs from all the donors that night. Then hub operations initiates a matching run. Yeah. Matching run is based on the seven donor characteristics and the 21 recipient characteristics. We're going to come back to those characteristics in a moment. Uh, the matching run goes through seven tiers. Super urgent, hepatoblastoma, intestinal, liver and cardiothoracic, split liver, elective liver patients, so everyone on the liver transplant list, offered by transplant benefit score. Again, that's something we're going to come back to for either chronic liver disease and hepatocellular carcinoma, or variant syndrome, and seven, fast track. <coughs> and then liver offers are made by the hub operations, not the SNOD, uh, including split liver offering. Centre has 45 minutes to consider the offer. If three centres decline for a donor or organ function reason, or after five hours, the organ goes to the fast track offer system, and there's an, either an acceptance of offer or all centre decline. If we can just go back to the top, please, Lawrence. And we see the matching run going through the seven tiers. Can you um, explain for us um, what this is dealing with? Okay, so um, super urgent are patients who have 48 hours to live. So the most common, for ex there's lots of examples of things that cause super urgent liver failure. Um, a very common example is someone who's taken a paracetamol overdose. Um, antibiotics, there are certain antibiotics that patients are essentially sensitive to, 
that lead to cholestatic liver disease, for example, am am amoxicillin, ampicillin, can, if you have a genetic, genetic predisposition, you can end up in acute liver failure. Those patients take priority above anyone else. They are listed by each unit, and every day there's someone who monitors that list. So you will have to register them as super urgent. You'll have to justify why they're super urgent. All centers have to agree that they accept that these patients are going to be dead in 48 hours. And then they get listed essentially in order of, of, of the time they're listed. Because it's very difficult to decide who's more urgent in that category of patients. So if Newcastle list at 8 o'clock in the morning, Birmingham list at 9 o'clock, they come second. So Bur uh, Newcastle will be offered the first liver. Obviously, it's based on size and blood group. And so we very seldom cross the blood group. Um, you can be either identical or, or compatible. It means you, know, you can have a universal donor like blood group A, the blood group O, or you have A to A, B to B. And you get listed, they get listed on average every day. There's maybe two or one, one or two. They get transplanted usually on an average in 1.2 days when they get a liver. That's the first group. And that's purely on need because they're going to die and you get, they get the liver first, wherever the liver is in the country. And they could be offered both DBD or DCD. So that comes, that'll be the clinician's decision. They know how sick their patient is. The intensivists know how sick the patient is. If you have a young person who, for example, has taken a paracetamol overdose and they're pretty much ready to die, you will take whatever's available to save their life. Young person, fit, would withstand the complications of an organ that may not work that well in the first few days. So you'd give them the chance. So that's clinical acumen has to come into it. The second phase is hepatoblastoma. That's the type of cancer that children get. Um, it's, a, it's a cancer that is local to the liver. It very seldom spreads anywhere else. There's very strict criteria for transplanting these patients. The vast majority, we remove them, we resect them from the liver. But there's a very small group of patients that need a transplant. They do extremely well within the criteria which we've set. And so if there are any hepatoblastoma patients, and they're usually in, you know, young, so we're talking about between 18 months, four years, they select pediatrics, so there'll always be a pediatric center that'll be accepting this. And it'll usually be a split liver, so it'll be an adult liver that's been cut in half. So actually, you're giving the other half to an adult somewhere else. So they next in line because they don't have a lot of time to wait because they get chemotherapy to shrink the tumor. And then there's a very important tight timeline, otherwise we'll start to grow again. The next group is intestinal. So these are patients who are, have multivisceral transplants. So they're patients who have uh, um, intestinal failure and they need a liver and small bowel transplant. Now the numbers on the list, they're, they're number about 20 in total for the whole country. They're only done in one center in the country, the, the liver small bowel for adults is done in Cambridge, and for pediatrics is done in, in Birmingham and Kings. And there's a small number of patients, and the, and the donors have to, be, have to be very specific donors. So they, they, they don't take a lot of organs, but they need, they need perfect organs. So that's why they've come in, as in into the offering system above everything else, just in case there is the perfect donor for them on, on the night. And then we have liver and heart, liver and lung. And those patients wait a huge amount of time because to get the ideal liver and the ideal heart to transplant together. Now, there's only two centers in the country that do that. It's Newcastle and Cambridge. And they have all the patients waiting on that waiting list. In Newcastle, I can tell you there's six, and in Cambridge there's two. So there's not a lot of patients. But again, having a, a perfect heart, because actually the, num the, the, the donors that we have now, a lot of them are elderly. The majority of the donors are over 50, and 
a third of the donor is now over, over 60, and we've got 25% are obese. So their liver's going to be fatty, their hearts are going to have a lot of fat. So you have to choose the right organs, because to put both in together, they have to work or you have a bad outcome. So they get an option of choosing the right. If the right donor comes up, they get it first. And then we go to split liver transplants. And, and over the years, we've managed to increase the number of livers we give to patients by dividing them in half. So the left, the, the liver is designed in, by whoever designed it in a way that you can actually divide it up. And so you can divide it up into a left half and a right half, or you can divide it into a left lateral, which is half the left side, and the rest called the extended right side. The, the majority of the, the split livers go to a child, so we take the left half of the left side to the child, and the other half goes to the adult. And so we can get two transplants out of one liver. Again, they have this specific criteria, which are in the policies, and the hub operations know. So actually what happens is it's automated. So if a liver comes up from a, from a donor which meets the criteria, I mean, the units don't, don't have anything to do with it. Hub operations will say this liver is splittable, it needs to be split, and, and the process happens. And then once that's all done, we get to the national offerings list for elective chronic liver disease patients. And they're the ones that can wait the longest because they're on the waiting list the longest, usually. And the assessment then, it relates to the seven donor characteristics and the 21 recipient characteristics. Yeah. If we can turn on to page seven in this document, we have the donor criteria, age, cause of death, BMI, diabetes, donor type, blood group, and split liver criteria. And then if we turn on another page, we have the 21 factors for the recipient criteria. Uh, they are set out, age, gender, hepatitis C, disease group, creatinine, bilirubin, INR, sodium, potassium, albumin, renal support, inpatient status, previous abdominal surgery, encephalopathy, ascites, time on the waiting list, diabetes, maximum AFP level, maximum tumour size, two tumours, three or more tumours. Um, in terms of the hepatitis C category that's here uh, as part of the recipient criteria, um, how is the hepatitis C category used in the calculations of somebody's uh, transplant benefit score? It's just, so it's just one of the facts. So when we developed at the benefit score, we looked back at a, at a, a cohort of patients that were the, the, the control group. So we looked back four years to say, what happened to the patients with these characteristics? So we, we tried to find characteristics that would determine how best to allocate organs. And what came up was the characteristics you see, and which one of them was hepatitis C. So in 2010, um, it, where if you had hepatitis C, you did really, you did worse if that was your indication for transplant. This was, that was before the, the change in the drug profile. When you say somebody had hepatitis C, are you dealing there with somebody who has chronic active hepatitis C yeah. or somebody who historically has had chronic hepatitis C but now has a sustained virological response? In, in these criteria? Yes. So these are donors. So um, These are recipients. Uh, these are, no, these are recipients. So these recipients have all, would have all had treatment. No, there will be very few recipients that go on the waiting list now that don't get treated. There be, has to be really specific reasons why they're not being treated. So they'll all have been treated. So if that's their, in, their indication is, is hepatitis C and they've, they've been treated, then it's, it's a factor. We don't say whether they're treated or not. It's just still a factor because in the cohort analysis, it was such an important group of patients. I, pres I, I suspect that they beca it's becoming less of an important factor now, but it's still part of the criteria. So if they have hepatitis C, they get a certain amount of points in the, in the system. As opposed to other diseases, 
which don't get points at all. And, and in relation to that, hepatitis B isn't one of the no. recipient criteria. Why is that? I suspect it's statistical in that hepatitis B is not a very common disease in the UK at all. It's usually in the immigrant population, particularly patients who have emigrated from South, South Asia or Middle East. So we don't see a lot of hepatitis B. And when we did the cohort analysis, it probably was the prominent group of patients that impacted on outcome. Um, so that's probably why. Again, hepatitis B has been treated since 1994. They've had fantastic treatment. So actually, hepatitis B, once you get it, um, the very few patients need a transplant. They need a transplant either if they get a cancer or if they get acute hepatitis B. And acute hepatitis B would fall into the super urgent category. So chronic hepatitis B, with very few patients with hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis B get cirrhosis, as opposed to hepatitis C, where they 90% get cirrhosis. So they're very different diseases. Hepatitis C, the virus causes liver cell damage. Hepatitis B, it causes DNA damage and creates tumors. That's all it does. And how, if at all, are uh, recipients uh, addressed in these criteria if they are co-infected with HIV and hepatitis C? Um, so that, that's not, again, part of the criteria. And the reason is that, that we, don't, it's not a, a, we don't see a lot of patients with HIV that need liver transplants. Um, and again, it wasn't in the cohort analysis, so it can't, it we could, it can't really appear in here because we just didn't have the evidence that it made a difference. Most centers see very few patients with HIV that need liver transplants, pure HIV. And actually, if you've got HIV, it's a comorbidity. It's not an indication, unless you get a hepatopathy from HIV. And that can happen. Those patients are really sick. It's part of AIDS, and you wouldn't be an it wouldn't be an indication for transplantation. Hepatitis, uh, HIV that's managed with a good with a good uh, um, uh, uh, um, lymphocyte level will be treated like any other patient if they... So if they got hepatitis C and HIV, HIV is just a comorbidity. We manage that like we'd manage heart disease. They get their treatment, their CD4 count is monitored. As long as the CD4 count is good, they get, they get put on the list like anyone else. So there's no disadvantage to having hep uh, HIV. If you've got hepatopathy and all the problems that come with AIDS, that's not an indication for you. would never survive a liver transplant with that. So. When you did the cohort analysis, can you explain to us where that data came from? What period of time and from which centres did it come from? It came from all centres. It was from 2010 to 2014, I think it was done. So when you... So you is this right? You analysed four years of data across yep. all centres, all liver transplants, all liver transplants to yeah. assess the relative successes yeah. and failures. Yeah. And uh, you may not be able to answer this, this question, but w when that analysis was done, mm. um, w was there any additional consideration of the comorbidity of HIV and, and hepatitis C, or, or was it a case of looking at every factor and, and which... I mean, I think we looked at everything. Up. We looked at uh, whatever we thought would impact on, on s benefits. And, and our aim with the NLOS was to look at developing a transplant benefit score. And as you saw with the benefit meant was it was the difference between having patients able to wait on a waiting list safely versus patients who are going to die having a liver transplant. Because actually a liver transplant is a risky operation. So if you could wait, and, and the difference with this score is that we, the, the problem with liver transplant is that it takes, it takes two to tango. So there's a patient who's, got a, who's, got, who's unwell and has got a chronic disease, and then there's a liver. And every time a liver comes available, that liver is different. You know, it's not like you go to Tesco and take it off the shelf. 
So that liver has to be assessed in, con in, in co conjunction with that patient on that night. And that's what the score does. So it is unique in the world, is that we've got a liver and we've got a patient. Do the two match each other to give an outcome that is reasonable, that covers the whole country, that is equitable for everyone on the waiting list, that is safe for the patient and gets going to get an outcome which is, which is reasonable. I want to come to the transplant benefit score calculation in just one moment, but before we leave the recipient criteria, um, what relevance, I've been asked to ask, what relevance would the fact that a patient has a bleeding disorder, haemophilia or from Villa Brands, for example, uh, have in relation to these uh, criteria? None. Again, that's a comorbidity. And, and don't forget, most patients who've got chronic liver disease have got bleeding disorders. They don't, they don't, their blood clogs. A lot of the time they're on the list because that's one of the criteria to be you know, to confirm that they have end-stage liver failure and they're not going to recover. So we're talking about lots of patients who have PTs that are well in their 20s. Um, von Willeren's factor is a comorbidity that when we discuss those patients in the assessment meeting, the anaesthetists um, and the blood bank will know that these patients need to have special considerations when they have their transplant. But it's not about listening them or transplanting them. It's about making sure they get through it safely. That it's not, it doesn't impact on their, their op being offered a liver or being on a transplant list. And then if we turn back to page six of the document, we see the, the simple explanation that transplant benefit scores are then computed using the 21 recipient criteria and the seven donor criteria. As the donor changes, so will the benefit score. So recipients ranked highest on one matching run may not appear in the same rank with another donor. Mm -hmm. Now, um, for those who um, are uh, interested in the detail of the mathematical computation of the transplant benefit scores, uh, that can be found in WITN 7542012. Um, but for the purposes of today, Professor Manus, can you give us a layperson's explanation of how the transplant benefit score is calculated? <coughs> um, well, it's, it's calculated on a mathematical score. But um, as, you, as, the, as it says, every time a different organ comes in, the score will change. So there are two parts to the, to the equation. There's part M1, which is looking at patient's ability to wait on the waiting list, that survival on the waiting list. And the way we, when we list patients, we list patients, we look at survival from date of listing. So we don't, we don't, not just looking at survival from the transplant, because you could have months before that on the waiting list where you could be deteriorating. And, and that's really important to know, because what you want is to say, if you're going to put someone on a waiting list, it's pointless putting on a wait list and just letting them deteriorate, and then they get to a transplant and they die. So we, th this monitors the patient's intention to treat. So it's from the time they're listed till the time they get to a transplant. And the score M1 looks at how long they can th they wait. With the liver that's being offered that night. So M2 looks at the chance of survival with the transplant. So that says, this liver from a 75-year-old donor who is obese and has diabetes and has you know, a fatty organ, and here's the patient M1 who actually can wait on the trade list for three years. You give this liver to this patient, actually what you're doing is you're shortening their life because the M2 part of the equation tells you that they're going to probably die with that liver. So the, the score then will, bring the, will push the patient down the list because it's not the organ to have. If, the organs, if, the, if it comes in and M2 says, actually this is the, the patient will be much better getting this organ than waiting on the list, it pushes the score up. So, and the person at the top of the list gets offered, offered is different to allocation. So it gets offered to that patient. So it's offered to a named patient. That offer goes to the center where the patient is registered. 
what we've done with the scores, rather than, and, and this came from us dealing, you know, speaking to the patient groups, and you know, we took seven years to do this. This didn't happen overnight. So we had spoke to the patient groups, all the support groups, and said, how would you like this to work? And what they said was, they don't want an, a computer to tell us who needs a transplant. They want a computer to give advice to the clinician. So in other words, they wanted some clinical acumen in the decision. So what happens at night is if that score says M M1 is low, M2 is high, that means the transplant benefit score will be high, go for it. This is the patient that's come up top of the list. I get phoned and they say, there's a liver offer for Mr. X or Mrs. X. And you say, okay, tell me about the liver. And you, you, the clinician has the option to listen to all the characteristics. They know the patient, so they'll say, hmm, this is, I'm not sure about this liver, or that's great, let's go for it. The score says it's going to be good, we go for it. So the offer is made. Once the offer is accepted, then it's allocated to you know, Newcastle or Kings or wherever it goes. So there is that ability for the clinician to be involved. What we didn't want was for clinicians to make a subjective decision on their own, which was happening before. So if you, you know, you could get, if the, the organ was offered to the center, you could then say, okay, mm, I think I'll put it in Mr. X because I just like him. We couldn't allow that to happen. So that's why the score does tell you this is the right patient. And the vast majority of times they will accept that. There are times they don't accept it, and you have to respect the clinician's decision. But it's, um, it's, it, makes this, it makes it, in the middle of the night, much easier and safer and more equitable for the patient because you're not having to lie there thinking, is this the right thing? Because you know that the scores, we're pretty confident the score is, is, is accurate. And if we go back to page two, uh, which is the summary of the scheme, we see the third box from the bottom centre has 45 minutes to consider the offer. Mm. Um, in terms of the centre's decisions around considering the offer, you've discussed decisions then being taken by the clinical team. What involvement does the patient have uh, in those decisions? So there are two options. One is... Um, you, the, the patient can be told, here's a liver offer, it's offered for you, and the clinician will then say, but I'm concerned this, this is not the right thing for you. You've been in hospital last week, you know, you've had an infection, I think we should wait. Those kind of conversations happen all the time. I can't say that everyone does the same thing in every centre. I can't honestly say that that's what's always happening, but our recommendation is that that's what does happen. If it's clinical reasons why the clinician says no, then it's clinical reasons. If it's turned down because the theater is not available, or the surgeon is not available, or there's no theater staff, or there's COVID and everyone's off work, the patient has to be told that there was a missed opportunity. The, you were the named patient. There was a missed opportunity. We as NHSBT write to the patient and say, this has happened, and uh, there's duty of candor when it's logistic reasons. If it's clinical reasons, the clinician, the coordinator, and the patient communicate with each other. Once a liver has been declined by three centres or after five hours, then the organ goes to fast track offer. Yeah. And if we look at page three of this document, we pick that up. Um, the offerings made by hub operations. Each centre has 45 minutes to consider the offer and call in to accept the offer. If more than one centre is interested in the offer, the organ offer will be given to the centre with the highest ranked yeah. transplant benefit score patient. Hub operations will only inform the centre if their, organ, if their patient has been allocated the organ. If the centre does not receive a call, they'll know they did not have the highest TBS and they're not allocated the organ. 
Yeah. And then hub operations will then ring the, the, the uh, specialist nurse to organ donation to say that the organ has been accepted or will inform them there's been an all centre decline. Um, You've said that this then results in greater regional vari variability. Can you explain for us why that is? Well, once it goes to fast track, then um, then you you can you can essentially choose which patient you want to give it to. The reason why we allocate on the PBS is because that's the only way you can allocate to which centre. So, if three centres decline it and it goes to fast track. They decline it for a specific patient. So it's liver A to patient B doesn't match. But actually, on their own list, there's a patient with an HCC who's coming out of criteria. Or there's someone who's, who they know is probably would benefit. They would take it for that patient, but not for the patient that the TBS has said. But the only way you can allocate safely, uh, fairly, is to say, well, how do we do this? Well, we'll base on the center which has the next TBS patient high enough. But it doesn't mean that patient has to get it. It just means it's a way of giving it to the center so they can give it to the patient they want. They may give it to that TBS patient, or they may not. That document can come down now. Thank you, Lawrence. In terms of donors after circulatory death, um, how do uh, those uh, organs come to be offered to a transplant recipient? How is that process managed within a centre? Um, so uh, the, the organs are offered regionally, so where, wherever the d donation process was. So there are, there are essentially nine national organ retrieving services. They, so it's all the seven liver units, plus there's some... Um, some associated units that join. Um, the Carter, for example, doesn't have a liver unit, but they will do retrieval. Manchester doesn't have a liver unit, but they join in the retrieval service and Oxford. So there's seven plus those three. Um, and they join in. And what happens is, if there's a donor in Birmingham, then Birmingham, go, Birmingham team will go to the donor. They will retrieve the organs. And then, if it's a DCD, they will be they will be offered to the closest transplanting centres around Birmingham. So that will be Birmingham, and probably Leeds as, an, as the next one, or Cambridge. That's it. They will be offered to those first, because you want to keep the, the cold time down to as minimum as possible. Because, just for some science, I mean, the, the longer the, the liver is kept cold, and with no oxygen, the more damage happens to the organ. So you want to keep that as short as possible. So it goes to the regional center. They get offered first. If they say no, then it will go national, further out and nationally. So we try and, and most of the time it's taken regionally. And then within that center, um, the regional center where it goes, how will they determine so they, who so will they, receive it? They, so every center has their own li list. So we don't have a national waiting list. We have a national registry. In other words, I can't see the patients on Birmingham's list or King's list. I can't see that. Although we are developing that at the moment. At the moment, it's a registry. So that each center knows their own patients and they know who's on the list. From e from NHS BT's point of view, what we require is a prioritization for their local patients. So we have to see regularly how they've prioritized their patients. It has to be transparent as to why they've prioritized them. And we have to see regularly what the outcome is, what's happened to those patients. If you prioritize as number one and you haven't transplanted them, why? They also have to be very clearly stated on their, on their registration list that they're willing to accept the DCD or not. Now, we've, patients have are always asked in the consenting process as part of the Montgomery um, you know, material, is, is it the material risk to the patient? You have to tell them that some of these livers 
may struggle to work in the beginning, and they have to make a conscious decision as to say, yes, I'm willing to accept it or not. There's also lots of technology now, machine perfusion, that they have to consent to, that has to be written very explicitly on the local waiting list. We know on the NLOS system, but we don't know everyone's local list, so we have to have that clearly documented so we can, we can audit it all the time. And you've said in your statement that about 30 to 40% uh, percent of the livers uh, that are transplanted are from donors after circulatory death. That was when I wrote that. <laughs> I mean, this month it's 60%. So it's, it's very fluctuating. It's very variable. Some of those livers will be marked as marginal. Can you explain to us what that means and what the implications of that are? So mar marginal liver, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not a really, it's probably an unfortunate term to use because actually people think, well, they're, they're getting, you know, they're getting an inferior product. But um, we have to be honest. So if you've got a donor who's elderly, so elderly for all, for, so just put in perspective, in the United States, an elderly donor is 60. In the UK, UK an elderly donor is 75. So if you have a 75-year-old donor who has co a lot of comorbidity, particularly things that affect the liver, so di diabetes in particular, because diabetes produces fatty liver disease, it produces chronic, chronic liver damage. So if, you've got, so if you're elderly with diabetes and you've had a period of time where, where when the treatment is withdrawn, the time to death is extended. So we have four DCD livers, very strict criteria of time to death. So when you withdraw treatment, then what happens is the donor will go to the operating room and, and when all the consents are signed and the family have said their goodbyes and they're happy that we withdraw, treatment is stopped. From the point the treatment is stopped till the blood pressure falls to below 50, that's when, that's when the damage starts. So from 50 to death is called the functional warm ischemic time. And the longer that time is, the more damage you have. So there are livers where they, from, from the blood pressure falling to 50 to death takes five minutes. There are those that take 35 minutes. The 35 minute one will be a more problematic liver because it has more damage. So that will be a marginal liver. So you have to be clear to the patient when you're offering it that this has happened because it's a material risk for them and they have to be sure to, willing to accept that. And a lot of the patients, it's very difficult for patients on, who have chronic disease who are on a waiting list that you know worrying about dying and then you come to them as in the middle of the night and say, listen, we got this liver, but I'm not sure how good it's going to be. It's really confusing for them. You know, what do you say? Well, I could miss out my chance and, and then I'll be dead. So, so it is a difficult situation for them to be in. And so sometimes you have to help them make that decision. And if you feel in your heart of hearts, this is not going to be good for this patient, you have to be clear to them. But you have to offer them the ability to make the decision. In terms of the scheme, the, the, the National Liver Offering Scheme, I want to move on to consider how the parameters of that scheme might come to be changed. Mm. Um, if there was felt to be a need to change the parameters of the scheme or, or change the weighting of particular criteria, how procedurally would that be achieved? What's the process? Um, so we have a, a Liver Offering Monitoring Committee, which is an independent committee, that monitors the liver offering scheme. Um, and they look at, th they meet regularly as a group, um, started at three months. When the scheme looked like it was going well, they moved to six months, but actually we started to notice there were some issues. And the important thing is that they're independent, so they've had nothing to do with developing it. It'd be silly for me to be doing it, because you know, I'm invested in it. So they're totally independent. And they I pick, up, pick up problems. And they have picked up problems. So the, the thing that came out earliest was 
that a lot of patients who were of a certain age were getting offers higher up the list. So in other words, older, older patients were getting far more offers than the younger patients. And, and that was based on a statistical glitch which has been sorted. So that, the monitoring group picked that up and said, why is this the case? Looked at it, and they have a st stat st stats team that work with them. I mean, this is extremely complicated mathematics. I mean, I'm not going to even try and explain it. But they, they looked at it, looked at why that was happening, and were able to change it. The way it happens is they then come to the liver advisory group with their report and say, we are unhappy with this particular parameter. They produce the evidence, and then the liver advisory group with all the centers will vote and say, yes, okay, we agree, change it. So that was the first thing. The second thing was the paracellular cancer patients who were being disadvantaged. And they were being disadvantaged because the score was overestimating their ability to wait on the waiting list. And the reason that was the case was because in the score, one of the factors, the recipient factors, is bilirubin. Bilirubin is the level, is the kind of jaundice level that people have. And patients with hepatocellular cancer in the cohort group, the majority were not jaundiced. So when, when, the, ma when the maths were done, the equation underestimated their disease. What's happened is the monitoring group came back and said, this is wrong, something's not right here. And they looked at it and that's what they found. And what's happened, that's changed. So they've instituted those changes, which came about actually just a few months ago. And that's all changed now. So hepatocellular ca carcinoma patients get more advantage because the score underestimated it. We looked at retransplanting. And, this, and again, they said they think there's a problem. Actually, when we looked at it and looked at the equation, there's not a problem. So that hasn't been changed. So that's happened. It's a very dynamic thing all the time. And we're very aware that things will happen and they will be changed. If the scheme were to be amended uh, so that those who were infected by blood uh, um, or blood products were able to receive a liver transplant after the age of 70, is that something that needs to be changed? Let me rephrase that question. Mm -hmm. How is chronological age dealt with in this scheme? I mean, age, age is, is, a fa is, a, is a factor, but that doesn't mean people, uh, there's no age limit at all. When we started doing liver transplant, and when I started in life, you know, I can't remember when, we used to, we used to limit the number to the age was 50. We didn't transplant anyone over the age of 50. Um, then we moved to 60, then we moved to 70. There's no age limit. It's physiological age, not chronological age. So, you know, most, many centers have transplanted patients well into the 70s. In your statement, you've talked about uh, how the scheme might be amended if um, it were to be amended to add the fact that someone had been infected with HIV or hepatitis C or hepatitis B by blood or blood products. If that were to be added as a factor that weighed towards them being given greater prioritization in the list, you said that could be achieved by variant listing and by the use of center-based DCD offers. Mm. Can you first of all explain to us what you mean by variant listing? So in the, in the NLOS, there are three, criteria, there's three categories. There's patients with chronic liver disease. There are patients with chronic liver disease who have hepatocellular cancer. And then there's patients who have a variant syndrome. Variant syndrome are patients who are not going to score highly because they don't have you know, chronic liver disease. So, if, for example, people with polycystic liver disease. Polycystic liver disease is a condition where their livers become massive, with massive cysts, which essentially takes over the, their body. We're talking about livers that are that size, where they have no quality of life, where they can't get out of bed, they will never score highly on the TBS system because the criteria will, you know, they, they haven't got chronic liver disease. Um, the people who have uh, high pulmonary pressures because of their liver disease, they won't score highly. Um, there are a number of these variant syndromes, uh, people with 
hypoxylosis, for example. There, there are a number of them. Because they won't score highly, what we've done is we've looked back over the years at the number of times those patients needed a transplant and how long they needed to wait. And we found that on average about 10% of the patients every year in that group were transplanted. And so what we've done is we've proportionally given livers to those, those group of patients. Otherwise, they would wait years. So every time the TBS is run, every, around every 20th liver that's offered is offered first to a variant syndrome patient. And if, they, if the clinicians say it's not appropriate, then it goes back into the chronic list. So we've done the proportional model to give them a proportion. So, so now I'm not, I, I believe the TBS system caters for anyone whose liver is decompensating. So if you had hepatitis C, hepatitis B and HIV all co-infected with chronic liver disease and you were on the waiting list, this system will pick you up when you're ready to be transplanted because it tells you exactly when the right time is. Can you wait? Is this liver the right one? If it is, you get it. If you decompensate, in other words, if your M1 says you can't wait on the waiting list because your liver's getting worse, you getting worse, you'll be pushed off the list very quickly. So you'll then get the offer when you need it. We have to balance the, 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 the whole country who are all waiting with you know, a, group of pa a specific group of patients who have been disadvantaged. So we've got to find that balance. So you could, using the variant syndrome, say, well, we could put some of these patients into the variant syndrome. But they do have chronic liver disease. If they're on the list, they have chronic liver disease. Because they've been treated for their hepatitis C, which the vast majority will have now, they, they will have an ability to wait until they decompensate and the score will pick them up. What I suggested in my report was if we were going to look at a way of trying to give some advantage, then the system has the variant syndrome list. Or you could say, well, every center could use the DCDs that they have that are allocated to them and in their list that they give to us, they could itemize which patients have been co-infected and why they're on the list and why they're getting priority. But I think the NLOS system gives is much safer because it monitors them all the time and they will, every time there's an offer, they will be in the system. And when they decompensate, they get it. They're not disadvantaged at all. We make sure, I mean, the system makes sure of that. And I'm asked to ask you whether that view, based on the availability of present treatment for hepatitis C, um, is that what the view is based on? Mm. Or are you also taking into account those whose liver condition progressed and deteriorated prior to the modern treatments being available? It's, no, it was based on what's currently available. I mean, what happened before is, is you know, is terrible. And actually, the treatments in those days were not good. And I'd be first to admit that actually patients struggled with the treatment besides the disease. They had to get, you know, ribavirin interferon. And then, you know, if you had HIV on top of that, it's, it's horrendous. Um, and if we, if we were in that time, I think it would be different. We'd have to be saying, well, what are we going to do about these patients? But because we're in a different era now, it is such a different era. I mean, you know, hepatitis C was a concern 10 years ago. We thought we were going to run into big trouble. And we've, we've amazingly turned it around, when well, I haven't, but this, the, the drugs available are so amazing that actually it's not an issue anymore. So for those listening who um, did have that historic treatment, mm. the interfere on the ribavirin, um, and their livers were deteriorating over a, a long period of time, and they may then have benefited from the modern treatments. How are they accounted for within the system? Now, you mean? Yes, if they, if I they mean, now... That, so it would be based on what their, how their liver is now. So if, they, if, they live, if, if they've been through that process of being treated before... And actually, one of the big problems with that treatment is you couldn't, with, uh, couldn't withstand it. 
it was it it was it worked if you could have the whole treatment, but very often people just couldn't. The interferon was a disaster. It was a nightmare treatment. Um, and that's why they all just fell off the treatment uh, pathway. Um, but what, what we do now is we treat people based on their liver disease, irrespective of what the treatment is. So even if their viral load is really low, but their liver is deteriorating, they will be treated according to their liver disease. So if they get ascites, if they get encephalopathy, if they get uh, variceal bleeding, I mean, that will be the way they get pushed up the list because those are the patients that can't wait. And that's what the score does. It pushes you straight up the list. So. And finally, I'm asked to ask you whether any statistical analysis has been conducted nationally to understand who in the registry was infected, previously infected, with hepatitis C, hepatitis B, uh, from infected blood and infected blood products? No, I don't think so. So those are the questions I have um, for Professor Manus. I obviously uh, would like to and need to establish whether there are any other questions that recognised legal representatives would like me to ask. Well, we'll, 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 take, a, we'll take a break in that case um, uh, and aim to come back at uh, quarter to 12. Uh, let me just explain, Professor. Um, the, uh, the core participants in the inquiry uh, who have representation are entitled through those representatives to put questions to be asked uh, of you uh, and plainly counsel uh, has to find out what those questions are. Right, right. Um, they will have read your statement um, but obviously they won't have listened to what you've had to say. Uh, and you've now, now that you've said it, so that may give rise to some further questions. Oh, okay. uh, so we give them an opportunity. If I say not before quarter to 12, that allows for the, uh, the fact that some of those questions may take a while to come through, uh, and if so, there will be a slight delay, but you'll be told. Otherwise, quarter to 12, I can't tell you how long after that uh, you'll be okay. saying. Yeah, sure, fine. Thank you. Not before quarter to 12. <laughs>